Hello, my name is Mr. Chipman, and I am the biology teacher at Murray High School in Murray, Kentucky. And here is 1.2 of AP uh, Environmental Science, Terrestrial Biomes. Let's look at this. So first of all, terrestrial uh, means like the Earth, right? As opposed to extraterrestrial, which is outside the Earth. So when we're talking about terrestrial biomes, we are talking about, well, what is a biome? Biome is a large area, typically a large area, not necessarily though, but that has a similar climate and communities. Climate has to do with long-term patterns in temperature and precipitation. Communities have to do with a group of living things that live in that area. And so a desert, for instance, a desert is an example of a biome. There are deserts all over the world. Those deserts that are in different parts of the world are going to exhibit similar climate and communities, right? Arctic, uh, tundra, tropical rainforest, deciduous forest, all of these are examples of biomes, and each one of those biomes are going to have a specific climate and are going to have specific communities. Uh, a little bit more about the communities. A lot of times you'll see the words flora and fauna used. Flora has to do with the type of vegetation that is going to be found there, whereas fauna has to do with the types of animals that are going to be found there. It doesn't mean that you find the same species in each one of those different areas across the world, but you're going to find similar kinds of things like large herbivores, uh, big predators, whatever it is, right? Even down to like certain kinds of reptiles or certain kinds of primates or, or whatever. You get the idea. So different kinds of examples of biomes. Um, we have tropical rainforest. It's typically hot year-round, very dense canopy, which is like the, the tree cover. Uh, poor, poor soil nutrients. Why? Because all the nutrients are in the trees. Right? They've, they've sucked the nutrients out of the soil. Uh, lots of biodiversity because there's lots of temperature and lots of precipitation. Uh, temperate rainforest. Temperate means less hot. Um, lots of rain typically and so then you have lots of vegetation so it's not frozen but it's still it's not as hot as a tropical place but there's still lots of vegetation because there's lots of precipitation um, sometimes you'll see these called like seasonal forests like a seasonal forest is more what we have here uh, where you have warmer summers colder winters you get the idea and sometimes you'll have something what's called a temperate rainforest right uh, which is a rainforest uh, but it is not hot all year round, right? Uh, Pacific Northwest is a great example of that. Taiga or boreal forest, and you see in this picture, uh, lots of conifers, colder temperatures, uh, nutrients are poor in the soil as well, just because of the fact that all the nutrients are in the trees again. Uh, tundra, tundra has to do with very cold, frozen ground for some parts of the year, low precipitation as well. Uh, usually smaller types of plants like mosses and lichens, uh, no trees typically in the tundra as well. Uh, savanna, savanna is typically used as a grassland, um, lots of larger grazing type animals, uh, small shrubs and grasses, uh, very warm and seasonal rainfall typically. A lot of times in a savanna they don't have like fall, winter, summer they have like rainy and not rainy, right? Just like two seasons. And a lot of places are like that in the world. Uh, shrubland or sh chaparral is not on here. This is hot and dry, but then uh, usually wetter, milder um, winters. And then most of the plants in a chaparral are adapted to fire because of the hot, dry summers, things catch on fire. And they're adapted to that. In fact, require it for reproduction. Uh, United States Southwest, great example this in the desert extremely dry extremely hot organisms there are adapted to low amounts of water and high temperatures these are just a few examples right of biomes and so uh, understand that when you're when you're talking about that again you're talking about similar climate and community and here's a good way to uh, look at a biome these are called a climate graph or climatograph sometimes you'll see them called climatogram as well, which sounds like a birthday greeting or something. And they show two things, right? Rainfall and temperature, because uh, they're based on precipitation and temperature climate is. And you can see how they rise and fall throughout the year, depending on the type of place, because this one has warm summers, 
colder winters, precipitation is going to kind of grow with that as well. You'd expect this to be some sort of like deciduous forest or something along those lines is my guess, where you have the drier parts of the year um, and then the, the wetter parts of the year, and you can kind of see how that works. Very interesting. Resource distribution. Now, this is the idea that in different parts of the world, you have resources that are going to be distributed differently. What does that mean? Well, in some parts of the world, you have mountains, and so resources are going to be lower. In other parts of the world, you're going to have more like uh, plains or grassland type area, and it's going to have more, uh, for instance, more nutrients in the soil than some place that is mostly trees, right? Because there's a lot of turnover with the organism, a lot of decomposition. Therefore, the distribution of resources are going to be completely different. In a rainforest, you look at a rainforest and you think nutrients. No, there's not a lot of nutrients in the soil. Why? Because there's not a lot of turnover. Most of the organisms are these giant trees, and so they don't die very often, right? They live a long time, and so they keep all their nutrients for a long time. Um, a couple of things that, you know, with this, we talked about climate. Climate is directly affected by latitude and altitude, and I'll be talking about that briefly as well. Uh, soil fertility has to do with, again, we talked about distribution, or we talked about decomposition rates, and just the, just the geographical area. Something can be close to the equator, but if there's mountains there, the temperatures are going to be different. And so understanding that the distribution of resources is directly tied to not only position on the earth, but also the type of, the type of features that are found there. And because of this, biomes are dynamic. Uh, dynamic just has to do with change. Understand that a biome is not a static thing, but the earth is constantly changing, therefore the biomes on the earth are also changing. Now, there could be changes based on the types of organisms that live on the earth, say, you know, humans. Uh, but this shows in the past, uh, and even more distant past, there's, there was a different distribution of the types of trees that you found in the eastern United States. Mostly were pine. Now, you did have these hardwood kind of, and when I say hardwood, I'm talking about like oak and hickory and uh, elm and ash and some of that stuff. Um, you had these hardwood concentrations, but most of the southern United States was pine, and the northern United States were these specific kinds of hardwood forests. What has happened because of population changes and um, geographical changes associated with um, deforestation and, um, you know, gathering lumber and all this sort of thing is that the forests have changed right and now you have primarily oak hickory type forests that have taken over large swaths of the united states uh, the pine trees have are you know largely losing their original habitat because of their they're being farmed right because they make good lumber to build houses and that's the idea and so a lot of what you'll see called like original forests or uh, old growth kind of pine forests don't really exist anymore. They're mainly uh, the southern United States, way south United States. You see the down there the uh, like longleaf pine, the, um, in particular the loblolly pine, which is much less prevalent now as well. Uh, these forests, which used to be uh, significantly prevalent across the United States, are much less so because of changes in population and distributions. A couple of examples that are important here have to do with the patterns associated with latitude. One of the latitude, as you get further north or south, you lose temperature. Uh, as you get closer to the equator, you gain temperature. And this also with precipitation. Precipitation is going to be more located toward the equator and also in the tropic areas. So when I say tropic, I have to do with, has to do with the lines on the, uh, on the latitude. And so like between the 30 and the 60 is what we would call like a temperate zone. And so there's a lot more precipitation in temperate zones than there are between 0 and 30. What do you find between 0 and 30? more deserts, right? And it has to do with the way the wind is blowing, the way that the uh, warm air rises and gets rid of all of its condensation. And um, there's some of, a lot of the stuff that you, you don't have to concern yourself with as much now, but you can kind of see here, you know, these are called Hadley cells, not important, 
but how when warm air rises, it gets rid of all of its precipitation. There's none left, and so that's why you have desert here. Well, when the warm air collects, when it collects that moisture again, it rains it out again. That's why you have a lot of forest in this band. And then down up in the poles, there's no precipitation. Why is there so much snow? Well, it just never melts because it's cold. Something that mimics latitude is altitude. And so, you know, the idea that as you climb a mountain, it's almost like going from the equator to the poles, right? Because you start at the bottom where there's more precipitation, less temperature, or more temperature, but as you get higher and higher up, you have less and less precipitation and less and less temperature. And so altitude oftentimes mimics what you see, the patterns on latitude. <clears throat> and then lastly, humans can't impact an ecosystem directly. Here's a population density map. And so where populations are most dense, you would expect those populations to have more impact on the environment. A population like, say, um, the whole western side of Russia, or eastern side of Russia, excuse me, is a very uh, sparsely populated area the ecosystems are going to be largely untouched, right? Uh, Canada, another great example, very sparsely populated area toward, especially northern Canada. Um, very, you know, very untouched areas for, for generations. But as, as you get closer to population centers, as you get closer to where people live, you're going to have ecosystems that have a lot more turnover. And so understand that biomes can have more change based on, uh, directly based on where humans live in, uh, in that context. So let's look at the practice question. Which of the following best explains why the soil in tropical rainforest tends to be nutrient poor despite the ecosystem's high productivity? Take a minute, pause the video, see what you got. And let's look. Wrap it up, taking nutrients by dense vegetation, heavy rainfall, leaching. We didn't talk about leaching. Uh, leaching is the idea that the nutrients are basically being sucked through the soil and uh, as opposed to being brought up by the, the organism itself. And so that can also cause an issue. Low rates of decomposition due to cold temperatures. It's not cold at the rainforest. Frequent fires, it's not happening either because it's raining all the time. High elevation, not necessarily. Uh, B is the best answer. Hopefully this practice helped. We are moving on to 1.3.